All right. I think it is exactly, uh, well, 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock on my uh, phone that's in London time. So let's get started. My name's Liz Rice. I'm going to be talking today about using a project called Tetragon, which is part of Cilium, to uh, help us deal with a newly published zero day vulnerability. So uh, yeah, my name is Liz Rice. I've done quite a lot of work recently on eBPF, uh, previously done quite a lot of work around containers and container security. Uh, I'm on the governing board for the um, CNCF, uh, also for Open UK. Go and see them in the uh, sponsor area. They've got a, a table there. And I work at Isovalent, which recently got acquired by Cisco. And we're probably best known for creating the Cilium project and being co-creators of eBPF within the Linux kernel. So eBPF is this incredibly powerful technology within the kernel that underpins the Cilium project and its observability component Hubble and then Tetragon, which is the newest member of the Cilium family and allows us to do runtime, security, observability and enforcement, which is what I'm mostly going to be talking about today. Anybody here already using Cilium? A few hands. Anybody here already using Tetragon? Oh, good one. OK. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be a few more after this talk when you see what we can do with it. How many of you here are familiar with eBPF? Okay, uh, maybe a third of you. Okay, so eBPF allows us to customise the way that the kernel <coughs> behaves. Don't worry about what it stands for because the last two letters are packet filtering and that's pretty misleading now because we can do so much more with eBPF than filter packets. You can filter packets, but we can do so many other things with it that we just consider eBPF a standalone term. Most of the time, application developers are writing code in user space and they don't really have to think about the kernel at all. But in reality, the kernel is involved every time we do anything that touches hardware. So if we're accessing files or sending and receiving messages over a network, or if we're allocating memory, all of these things are examples where the kernel has to be involved. Applications we're typically writing in a higher level programming language that abstracts away the system calls that, for example, if you open a file, there's going to be some variant of an open system call that gets called to ask the kernel to actually go and open that file for the application. So applications are constantly asking the kernel for assistance. And with eBPF, we can write custom programs, load them into the kernel and attach them to events. Those events could be opening a file or Actually, any function call in the kernel, any trace point in the kernel could be a network packet arriving on a network interface or arriving at various different places in the networking stack. There are pretty much limitless events that we can attach our eBPF programs to. And we can use those programs to observe the fact that that event has taken place or even affect the outcome of that event in some cases. As well as interacting with hardware, the kernel is also coordinating all the different user space processes that are running on a given machine at any given time. Uh, and it's looking after things like permissions, capabilities. Are you allowed to open this file, for example? So from a security perspective, a lot of the things that the kernel is doing or involved with, like sending and receiving network messages or file access or starting and stopping new executables or checking and possibly even changing privileges. All of these things are really interesting if we are interested in security. If we want to know about certain events that are rele relevant for security, a lot of these things are happening in the kernel. So we can use eBPF programs to detect those events and report them. And that's what we're doing with Tetragon. 
So Tetragon is part of the Cilium project. You'll find it on GitHub under Cilium slash Tetragon. So it's owned by the CNCF and uh, it's a community project. The reason why we've separated it out from Cilium is we can use it in a Kubernetes environment like Cilium, but we can also use it in a any container environment or even directly on a host. So we can actually observe processes running directly on a host if we want to. And today, to keep things simple, I'm going to be showing it running uh, or observing events in just regular Docker containers. We'll also see some processes running directly on the host. I'll come back later to the fact that we can also get some Kubernetes relevant data because that will be, uh, well, it is useful if you're in that environment. So I think I should stop talking about it and show it. It's nice that the sun has come out, but it does mean I, I, it's a little bit harder to see the screen than I was hoping. But uh, is it more or less big enough that you can see? Yep, thumbs up, awesome. So the first thing I just want to show you is that I have uh, a couple of aliases set up to make my life easier and mean I don't have to type quite so much. So I've actually got two Docker containers running. One is running Tetragon. The other is running uh, an XZ backdoor that we will use as an example later. So if I want to execute a command in my Tetragon container, I've got an alias DT to make my life easier and so you don't have to watch me typing quite so much. And if I, let's put this in here, if I do get events and I'm going to output in uh, compact format, this is asking Tetragon to tell us about events. By default, it's going to tell us about processes starting and processes stopping. And that's all it's going to tell us for now. So if I run a command, and I'm running this directly on this virtual machine, I can see that process entry and process exit. I'll do another one. Uh, let's look at that not sensitive file, for example. We see process entry, process exit. So whenever a process starts and stops, we might occasionally see some other kind of system processes starting and stopping. We'll see that output. So this is a nice human readable format, but uh, it's actually, if I just show the raw events and just run a command, you can see it's actually backed by quite a lot of JSON information here. Uh, we've got, for example, the process IDs, we've got what commands, oh, sorry, what the current working directory is. We can see the command that was run. Uh, there's things like, the time it was started. And we also have information about the parent. So for each event, we see information about that, the context around that event. So for a process starting and stopping, it's a process. And we also see information about the parent process. And uh, that's going to be useful when we come to talking about uh, process hierarchy. So we will be coming back to this kind of event and its parent information. Okay, so right now we're just seeing these process entry and exit events, but we can also customize the set of events we're going to get reported by adding a policy. Uh, now, I've got a few policies. TP stands for tracing policies. I've got a few policies loaded but not enabled right now. And I'm going to start by enabling the uh, file monitoring filter, filtered, monitoring filtered. And let's just check that. Yeah, so that's now enabled. Let's stop this, get this uh, doing nice human readable output again. So if I look at the, that f the policy definition that I've just enabled, it's actually quite complex, but 
The important thing is we've got a lot of different files that we've, we've decided that we're interested in with this policy. We're essentially saying there are some sensitive files like etc. shadow, uh, maybe the bash scripts that gets executed when people log in, the profile, so on. All these files, we considered them to be sensitive. We've created this kind of example policy. This is available in the Tetragon repo for telling you about access to sensitive files that you might be interested in from a security perspective. This is uh, some example of what I was saying. There might be some system uh, executables going on that we might see in, that, in the log output. And we can actually see they've probably written to some sensitive files. So let me quit out of here. And so if I do, if I cat a not sensitive file, at the bottom there, you can see we got the process entry and exit for the cat executable, but that's all we saw. If I do the same thing, but for a file that we uh, think is sensitive, like etc. shadow, we not only see the process entry and exit, but we can also see a couple of read events here. So what we're doing with that policy is saying, tell me about some additional events. In this example here, it was read. We actually got conveniently some writes where there was some logging going on here. Um, so that policy has determined what event information we're getting. Okay. So file access is just one example of the kind of events that we can write Tetragon policies for so that we can get events generated for those or, or JSON event information for those events. So other things that we might want to get information about involve network connections, changing Linux namespaces, changing privileges, um, yeah, accessing files like we saw. There are lots of things that we might write policies for. Now, if we collected all of this information, that would be a lot of events. So we want to be, you know, a little bit picky about the kind of events that we want to get generated information for. Let's now turn to how we could use some of these events to um, help us deal with a newly published vulnerability. So a zero day is basically just a vulnerability that's been discovered. And typically when that, I mean, there'll be a period where um, it's probably kept secret, people are trying to create a fix for that vulnerability, they want to be able to publish the patched version at the same time as they publish the actual vulnerability itself. And there's typically going to be, okay, we now know about this particular CVE, Common Vulnerability Enumerator, we know this CVE exists, it's however severe it is and it affects a certain library and certain version numbers of that library. And there's usually a patch published at the same time. So they'll say, if you're running one of these affected versions, you should upgrade to a fixed version. So if you want to uh, know whether or not you're affected by one of these zero days, you know there's a certain version that's been, uh, that's affected. You want to know whether any of your container images are using that version of the library or whether it's deployed into any of your systems. And there is tons of really good uh, tooling out there that allows you to understand the software bill of materials, that allows you to scan your images, that allows you to know whether or not your images contain that vulnerability. So that's all really useful and can help you to figure out what images you need to rebuild. But Build time tooling can't tell you where are those affected packages actually running. If you're responsible for a large deployment, thousands of machines, you want to know where those packages are actually running. You want to know whether or not you've been affected by this exploit. Is it actually being run on your system right now? Have you been affected in the past already? Do you need to just deploy the fixed version of that library, or have you actually got a bigger problem because you have been exploited and you've lost data? Build time tooling can't tell you any of that. 
But runtime tooling can help you understand whether or not you're using the vulnerable package version and even whether or not the exploit has been run such that you have been compromised further because of this vulnerability. So what we're going to do now is look at a Tetragon policy for detecting a particular vulnerability. And the vulnerability that I'm going to use as the example is XEUtils compromise that was a severe compromise that you may have heard of from earlier this year. So this is the one where someone called Jia Tang Tan uh, spent years gaining credibility in the XEUtils project and making fixes in the XEUtils project. And in fact, what he was doing was inserting a backdoor. And in this particular version of this compression library, libLZMA, uh, it gets executed by uh, SSH. And this backdoor actually enables remote execution of any shell command. And what we're going to do with Tetragon is have a policy that's going to look for SSH calling that particular version of libLZMA. And we're going to use a very similar policy, but much uh, easier and shorter to read, to what we did with sensitive files. So um, I also want to just thanks to, for this demo, the backdoor image that I'm using is, uh, is this XZ bot by AML Weems. Uh, and that is using, uh, it, it's a containerized version of Resign's XZ backdoor version of the um, of the, um, the exploit. So let me show the exploit first of all. So if you remember, I've got, uh, oops, I've got a container running. Oh, I want to look for Docker. I wanted to show you. I've got a container running with this XZ backdoor um, exploitable version. And uh, DX is going to allow me to run commands in that container. So to start with, I still have sensitive files, but I don't have any other um, policies running right now. And I could, for example, execute, uh, let's execute the, the exploit. And I want, I'm going to tell it what command I want to, um, what I'm going to run. Let's say echo hello Vienna, write that into a file in the temp directory. So this is going to trigger the, rem the RCE, the remote executable, inside the container, inside the XE backdoor container. And in the top window, we can actually see this SSH handshake happening. It fails. That's that's okay. The exploit has been run regardless. And we can see that because in the, just using the default policies, we can see the SSHD process got executed. That's normal. But then we can see this shell executing my command. So the exploit was run. So let's take a look at a policy that could detect this. So XCUtils YAML file. And what we're doing is hooking to uh, a kernel function called security mmap file. So this is a file being mapped into memory. We're actually only interested when the binary that's involved is SSHD because we know this that that's the binary in which the exploit is kind of triggered. And we are only interested when the file being mapped into memory is libLZMA, one of the affected versions. So we're going to generate events when that happens. Okay. So let me, uh, I actually have the policy already loaded, but I need to enable it. So enable CVE 2024. You would think I might have been better off giving these rather shorter names, but it is what it is. Okay. And let's see. 
let's just check that it's there and it's now enabled. So if I run the exploit again, let's just write hello again. So we can see in the bottom window, we again got the SSHD executable being started, but then we get these extra events about uh, MMAP for one of the affected versions of libLZMA. So at the moment, all we've done is detect that the exploit has been run on this machine. And I should probably show you that it did actually um, work. Let me just cat out the contents of that file so you can see that, yeah, the, the, the file was written as we expected. So now I'm going to change the policy to one that will block. So let's just look at the difference. So instead of just posting a, an action, which is rate limited, uh, I'm going to change the policy to one that's going to kill when it sees the uh, memory map event or any of those memory map events, it's going to kill the corresponding process by sending a sig kill event directly from the kernel. So this is a synchronous sig kill. So I need to disable the policy that we were just running and enable the block version. Let's just check that I did. That's, yeah, that's how we want it to be. So now if I attempt to run that exploit again, um, and this time we can see that the SSH handshake didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't seem good. <laughs> That was not my exploit. I, tell you, I mean, that would be a pretty good effect if I could have done that. Uh, it seems like something has come unplugged, doesn't it? But um, shall I just carry on regardless, and we'll, we'll. Somebody got an idea? Oh, it's this one. Yeah, you can see that. I don't know what, that one's not even on, or it's not supposed to, I don't think it's on. Turn that off and on again, that seems to be all right. Don't think it was this. Ah, whatever you're turning there, that did help. <laughs> If anybody was able to go and get, I think the, oh, I think the, the AV person is actually in the other room, but, um, there was something you turned that turned, that did make it get quieter briefly, but, uh, yeah. If anybody felt, oh. Have you? Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Oh, whatever that was, it helped. <laughs> I think, I'm not even sure this is, is this, this isn't on anymore, is it? Yeah, it's on here, but yeah, I, I think that's. Valiantly. Oh, okay. So you can hear me now, right? A bit. <laughs> I think I'm just going to try and um, carry it. <laughs> this is so off putting. Okay. So what we could see in the bottom window, we saw the SHD process starting. Then we saw that MMAP, the first of those MMAP events being detected, and then we immediately saw that process being killed, which caused, which caused the SSHD process to exit. 
And if we look at the... Oh, God, that's an awful noise, isn't it? So if I try and look at the, the file, the one more time did not take effect, right? So we were able to prevent that remote exploit from actually happening by detecting the uh, vulnerable library in the first place. Okay. We've got a... <laughs> So as we saw, with the default Tetragon policy, we would know, we would have a record of processes starting and stopping. So that would include the remote execution happening. So even before we applied those uh, policies specific to the vulnerability, we would have had events being generated for the remote execution. We added the detection policy and that allowed us to see specifically that we, have, we are running this vulnerable version of the library. And if we add the block version, we can prevent that remote execution from taking place. Now, not everyone is always confident about applying, you know, blocking security policies in case that has some other unexpected side, you know, side effects. So I think you know, if you're responsible for security in a large deployment, you would want to be making decisions about the kind of risk reward of potentially um, blocking events. That policy looked for lib LZ, LZMA certain versions, but you could take that example policy for a different vulnerability and basically use that as a template because whatever library it is that you're interested in, whatever version numbers, you could just modify the templates, modify whatever the executable is that, I mean, in this example, we filtered it down effectively to only SSHD executions, but you could just say any MMAP of that library I'm interested in. And so you can use that as a, uh, as a template for any vulnerability going forward. And it's going to be pretty quick you know, to, to write that template or to modify that template for any newly published vulnerability. You can roll it out. I mean, if you're running Kubernetes, you can uh, have Tetragon running as a daemon set. So you can very quickly deploy that policy to all of your nodes. And because it's using eBPF, it doesn't require you to restart workloads. We're instrumenting the kernel that sits underneath all our running processes, all our running containers. So we can change the policies, we can change the eBPF pro programs that reflect those policies without having to affect any of the running applications. We immediately get the effect of those policies on our existing application. So we don't need to redeploy any applications to detect whether or not we've got those vulnerable versions running. And then we can use that to inform how we want to roll out the newly rebuilt images that don't have the vulnerable library. But in addition, we can also use those um, uh, default process entry and exits to understand whether or not we've already been exploited. Now, something I didn't mention was the eBPF verifier. So the verifier is used to, um, we, it checks, it analyzes every program as it's loaded to make sure that it's safe to run. So what that means is eBPF programs can't crash the kernel. We also, can do this at very, very low overhead. So we can create these policies. We talked about filtering them to specific, specific types of events. So in that example, we're only interested in the SSHD executable. We're only interested in events related to the vulnerable versions of those libraries. So we only actually generate from the kernel to user space any data when it's that particular filtered event. So unlike uh, many other tools in, in the eBPF landscape, 
will collect all of the events, so maybe all of the file opening events or all of the MM map, the memory mapping events, and send them all to user space and then compare against a profile in user space, or policy rather. With Tetragon, what we're doing is actually applying the policy within the kernel. So we're filtering those events within the kernel and we only generate the JSON logs or, you know, which could then be used to trigger events or metrics or alerts or what have you. We're only passing those to user space when they match our filter. So that massively reduces the amount of data that gets passed from kernel to user space. If it isn't one noise, it's another. Oh, well. <laughs> um, and this makes, because of this in-kernel filtering, Tetragon can be incredibly low overhead. So, for example, uh, as a sort of sample benchmark, we took building the kernel and looking at all the process executions, entries and exits as the, the default Tetragon profile uh, policy and comparing running a, a, a build of the kernel with no Tetragon or running with Tetragon is under 2% CPU additional usage. Even if we generate JSON events and actually write them to disk, it was under 3% CPU overhead. So that's a pretty low overhead for those baseline events. Then if we look at file monitoring, again, very minimal overhead where we're filtering in the kernel. The blue bar, which is a little bit more overhead, is another eBPF-based tool that's generating events for every file read. And the yellow bar is where we're filtering it down to some specific files that we're interested in. So we can really, with a carefully crafted policy that filters only the events we're interested in, it can be really, really efficient and low overhead. And then we can send those JSON events to any kind of SIM. We can send it to, you know, use that JSON uh, event to trigger alerts. We can use it to trigger metrics. So you can use that event in whatever way suits your operations. So let's just look at whether or not we got exploited. And uh, I showed you some event data from just running in a container and, or running on a host where you can see information about the process and its parent. If we're running in Kubernetes, we also get a lot of additional information about the container and the namespace and the, the Kubernetes environment that it's involved in. Those concepts don't really exist in the Linux kernel. So Tetragon has to do some work to map things like C group IDs to containers and from there to things like the Kubernetes uh, constructs. But because we've got that hierarchy of, you know, here is the process and here is its parent, and we know when that parent was started so we can look at what its parent was, we can build this kind of hierarchical uh, view of how any given executable started and when it got started and what its parents were. So in a Kubernetes environment, we're able to say, well, it's running in a particular namespace, it's in this particular pod, uh, it's using this particular container runtime. You know, we can see in my examples, you probably saw some run C uh, events being generated. And we can see the hierarchy of processes within the pod that actually caused an executable to run or the, the parents or the sort of ancestry of that uh, executable. So if we imagine one of these sort of lowest child processes in our X, XE example was the remote code execution, my echo command, for example. But we could have seen that that was being executed by SSHD and that that was executing in a certain container and so on and so forth. And that kind of contextual information could be really useful for figuring out, well, OK, so we have seen some SSHD processes executing some unexpected commands. Let's, let's explore the sort of forensics around that to see whether or not we've actually 
you know, had some kind of data exfiltration or something. So we can use that information uh, to generate for the forensics investigation that might need to take place if we knew we were running a, a vulnerable um, zero day. In addition to being able to send that information to whatever database or SIM that you want to send that event information, we also get uh, metrics in Prometheus format so we can see things like how many events have been triggered of various different types. So I just want to wrap up before hopefully we'll have time for a few questions um, with this really quite nice quote from Jason, who's a staff security engineer at GitHub, who have been using Tetragon for quite some time. And he talks about how Tetragon provides the security teams with rich data connecting important events and metadata into a single record, which allows them to answer questions about activity on their clusters down to the node, namespace, pod and container level minimal overhead, which is critical at their scale. So I hope that demonstration has sort of shown you or given you a taste of the kind of powerful things we can do with Tetragon. It is being used at scale. It's, uh, you know, built on eBPF, which is an incredibly powerful platform. If you want to know more about Tetragon, you can find documentation on tetragon.io. We also have some labs if you want to try it out in a kind of sandboxed environment. isurveillant.com slash labs has lots of different Cilium and Hubble and Tetragon uh, examples to play with. Hopefully we'll have time for a couple of questions now. And also tomorrow morning, I will be somewhere out there in 4F uh, if you want to come and have a chat about eBPF or anything else. So with that, apologies for the kind of sound issue. Uh, and uh, thank you for bearing with that. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Okay, so the question is, are there any benchmarks about how the solution scales with the number of rules? Uh, I don't think we have a particular benchmark of that. Uh, essentially, each policy or each sort of part of a policy is going to turn, it essentially gets compiled into eBPF programs. So the more uh, policies we have, the more programs there are loaded. Now that's only really going to create overhead when they get triggered. So if you have a policy that's detecting an event that never happens, it won't have any you know, just won't have any impact. Um, if you, I guess there might be some memory impact on maps, but it'll be trivial. Um, so it really is going to depend on how often the events get triggered, if that makes sense. So I don't, I think if you had a thousand events that were for a file read that you're detecting, that would be essentially the same as 500 file reads and 500 uh, I don't know, capability changes or something. It's, it's, it's all down to how fine-grained your, your policy is and how often it then gets triggered. Yeah. Yeah, sure. So I'm just going to repeat the question for the benefit of the sound. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, essentially, how, how do those policies get written? Who writes them? Where are they stored? Is there a community repository for them? So there are some examples in the Tetragon GitHub repo, and it's open source. So, you know, more examples are always welcome. It is certainly true that writing policies, it's pretty simple to take that particular policy and use it or translate it to a different library, a different version for a different vulnerability. Um, if you want to craft a, pr a policy from scratch, I mean, that sensitive files policy, that is a, an example that you can find in the, um, in the GitHub repo. But it did take a bit of knowledge about, well, first of all, what are those sensitive files? And secondly, how are they 
accessed, what are safe ways that we can hook into in the kernel. So it can be complex to write those policies. Um, I guess that's something that our team has expertise in. We welcome contributions, but I'm not going to say that writing policies is generally easy. It can be pretty hard. Yeah, yeah. So, um, again, for the benefit of uh, having a microphone, um, could that process of writing policies be automated and maybe provided as a service? Um, I, <laughs> I feel a bit bad because this is sort of a, an inadvertent plug, but um, one of the reasons why Cisco acquired iSurveillance is because they're super interested in the Tetragon technology and they're actually building it into a product called HyperShield, which does exactly that, sort of automates creating these policies and provides the service of distributing them and, and allows you to see things like whether other people have applied that policy safely or not. So apologies for that. But yes, that, that someone has thought of that idea. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> okay. Uh, I think the chat a bit further back was slightly faster to put a hand up. There you go. Cool. <laughs> yeah, so the question is, what's the most complicated policy you can write? I don't think I have a kind of concrete answer for that, but um, you can, there is a sort of concept of chaining these uh, events together. Um, and I would say, from what I have heard about, the most complex policies that I know our team have written have been to do with tracking privilege escalation and the variety of different like, paths through the kernel that can lead to that. Um, you know, if you want to say, here is a policy that will detect any kind of privilege escalation, there are a lot of different ways that can occur. So. Um, I don't think there is a bound to how complex they can be. <laughs> One last question, yeah. Basically a follow-up question to that, um, not how complicated the policy is, but the testing can be. So what testing is going to take place on that policy that you created? Like you're still going to stick to your like put in place where you're going to um, block incoming connection from the incoming payload? Yeah, okay. So the question is what are the actions that you can take? Um, you can generate events, you can rate limit those events, you can kill the process. Killing the process would block an incoming network connection. And we do block network connections using Cilium network policies. I'm not actually sure how we would do it with a Tetragon, whether, whether there's another way of blocking it that isn't just kill the process. But from a can you do it with eBPF technically perspective? Yes, you can definitely, you can just drop packets, which is how we do it in Cilium network policies. But I don't know if that's actually something you can write today in a Tetragon policy, I'm afraid. Okay. I think with that, we're probably out of time. So uh, thank you very much, everyone. And uh, again, thanks for putting up with the terrible noises. <laughs>